collectively is failing the commitment outlined in the Paris Agreement to keep global warming well below 1.5 degrees Celsius. If we continue down this path, we'll see an increased floodings, heat waves, and a loss of ecological diversity. And other effects that we are not able to see right now, but neither will we be able to recover from them. But one thing is certain. If we don't stand by the Paris Agreement, it will create millions of hardship and suffering for millions of people around the, around the globe. At the same time, the Dutch government is spending 40 billion on a yearly basis on fossil subsidies. Today, Room for Discussion will be interviewing Donald Poles, the director of Milieu Defensie, uh, renowned for their climate court case against Shell, their research on fossil subsidies, as well as their work uh, on climate activism. Milieu Defensie has been at the forefront for the fight of climate justice. To discuss this roadmap, let us welcome the director of Milieu Defensie, Donald Poles. Thank you, and thank you for being here. <laughs> Donald, welcome. Uh, you're originally from South Africa, but you went to university in the Netherlands. In fact, 21 years ago, you graduated, graduated in this city with a master's in env environmental policy. You've been working for climate organizations since. Did your youth in South Africa foster a specific motivation for a career that focuses on the preservation of the earth? Yeah, that is, uh, that is long ago, um, and the older you get, you tend to idolize uh, your youth. Um, but I'd say yes in two ways. The first is I grew up on, a, on a, what, that, what in South Africa is called a farm, a plaas. Um, uh, but uh, Dutch people and, and uh, Europeans would call it a, a nature reserve um, because it was enormous. The closest neighbors were, I'd say, 25 kilometers uh, away. Uh, so I, I've been born with a, 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 a very intense love of, of nature, but of course also um, apartheid. Uh, I experienced the, the last tail end of uh, apartheid, uh, a, a system that in its essence was designed to privilege me as a person with a white skin. So I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that the privilege that I've received I need to translate in doing something for uh, society, uh, giving something back. Yeah, and we will touch upon those privileges later, but I wonder, uh, can you already see the effects of climate change on your grandfather's range, from the place where you grew up? Yeah, um, of course, from climate science perspective, no single event can be directly attributed to climate change. It's a question about uh, chances of uh, increasing the, the chance that uh, events like uh, uh, in, in this specific case, uh, uh, dryness, uh, um, yeah. uh, droughts take place. And um, I remember that when I w we stayed at my um, at my great grandfather's uh, farm, and um, uh, it was in what is called the Seven Years Drought. South Africa is a very religious uh, country, so people often refer to, to there's also the seven years drought in the, in the Bible. And um, uh, his farm was very um, highly impacted by the drought. It, even he was destroyed as a farmer. And while we were uh, staying in his home, the cattle, he was a cattle farmer, um, smelled the last water, which was in, our, uh, in, the, in the home, in the house. And uh, so you had, in my experience, because I think I was probably nine, so uh, hundreds of cattle uh, turning around the, the house, smelling the water and crying for, for, for water, bellowing for, for water, which made an enormous impression uh, uh, on me. And of course, that is not directly climate change. I understand that. It's long ago. Mm -hmm. But these type of events uh, will take place much more often because of climate change. Thank you. And do you think you would still have the same path that you have today if it, you had a different upbringing? Ooh, that is, a <laughs> that is of course, um, th they say, as, as a general uh, life lesson, don't look back too, uh, too often. Um, but uh, I'd say these are all, if, if I'm an ocean, these are all streams that uh, ran into to the ocean. That is my personality. Okay. And... Now, looking more into Milieu Defensi as an organization, it began in 1971, founded by a group of scientists. Could
Could you briefly tell us about the vision and the work and how Milieu Defensi has since evolved over the past few decades? Um, yes, we were started as a, a group of concerned scientists uh, inspired by uh, the environmental defense in the US, and Milieu Defensi is a direct translation into Dutch from environmental defense. Um, but within a year, the scientists noticed that there were not that many scientists that were concerned enough to become part of a, an NGO. And then after a year, they decided that uh, the only way to really achieve uh, large-scale social change is uh, through public pressure, citizen mm -hmm. pressure. And they changed the organization in 1972 towards uh, uh, an organiza a member-based uh, organization. And um, uh, it is, as far as I, it is the biggest membership organization uh, in the Netherlands, uh, in any case, environmental organization, have always sort of prouded itself in mobilizing the general public to achieve uh, uh, social change. Mm -hmm. And since then, you've been involved in organizing a lot of climate rallies and a lot of influencing shareholder meetings. Um, of large multinationals filing court cases, as we all know, um, and working on policy proposals. What do you think would be the end goal, or what is one big goal that you seek to achieve as an organization, ultimately? Um, throughout my life, uh, or maybe I'll, I'll formulate it a bit differently. Um, I fundamentally believe that at the core of the systemic problem of environmental, of environmental challenges and climate change is uh, the, the position of large multinationals. Um, and to address all of biodiversity, all of the global public goods, climate change, public uh, uh, biodiversity, inequality, uh, increasingly artif artificial intelligence, at the core of that is the, the Big question, can we, as a democratic society, include multinational corporations in our regulation? Uh, the first multinational organization was founded in the 16, 1600s. Um, there's a bit of a discussion if it started in London or uh, Amsterdam, but the first, uh, and the one in Amsterdam in 1602 was the United East India Indian Company. Um, and we've created a, a an institution that is outside of all democratic regulation. There is no institution that manages a multinational corporation. And in the essence of all corporations is the externalization of cost. The only so externalization of cost is if you pollute as a company, that is a cost if you clear, clean it up. But so you want to externalize it, mm -hmm. uh, ensure that Government cleans the rivers and the uh, uh, air and uh, earth that is polluted. Uh, pay your uh, staff as low of, uh, a salary as possible in order for your shareholders to uh, become uh, more affluent. Uh, and the only way to ensure that they do not externalize environmental and social cost is regulation. But there's no institution that regulates multinational corporations because all of our uh, regulation is nationally based. Mm -hmm. So that is the challenge that, that we are working on, is how can we regulate multinational corporations so that they act in uh, the global good. And Sophia already mentioned that you take on multiple activities. So the court case against Shell, policy proposals, climate rallies, you go to shareholder meetings. What, in your opinion, has been the most effective strategy deployed by Milieu Defensi? And can we speak of one? I'd say our success is really our integrated, we call it integrated campaigning. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. we, many other NGOs do either litigation or uh, public uh, mobilization or lobbying or research. And what we do is do all of that together because we believe that only then can you achieve system change. So take uh, uh, the example of, uh, of Shell. Um, the Telegraph, that's the most right-wing large newspaper in the Netherlands, after we won our case, they said uh, Milieu de Fancy was always far in front of Shell in their communications. And sometimes people tell me, you only did the court case because you wanted some attention. And then I say, yes, that's true, because it's part of our... Uh, social change strategy. 
we want to change the public narrative. Mm -hmm. And you only change the public narrative if you're part of the conversation. So if I understand you correctly, you say that what Noyer Defensi makes stand out is that you have a complementary approach to climate activism. Yeah. What is then your perspective on other climate groups that use more confrontational forms of climate activism, such as road blockades, throwing tomato sauce at paintings, or as we speak, what is happening right now, uh, blockading the building of the Rabobank? Uh, what is your thoughts on these forms of what is, are your thoughts on these forms of activism? Yeah, let me be clear. There's one form of activism that is totally unacceptable, and that is violence. Um, and it needs to be said, and it needs to be said as often as possible, because the challenge of our time of climate change is so big, I believe and understand that the, especially young people could feel the, the, the seduction of going into violence, but that is totally destructive and will, will destroy the, the movement that has been very successful up until now. Um, having said that, uh, I understand different ways of activism. We share their objectives, but we believe that, uh, uh, for us, there's a, an, another way to achieve change. And, but when we focus back on these forms of activism that disobey the law, what do you think? Do they contribute to the public perspective on climate change in a positive way? Yeah. Um, let me say one thing. If Rosa Parks, uh, the black female that um, uh, was part of the movement against uh, separatism in the, in the U.S., if she uh, uh, accepted that she can only sit in the back of the bus, probably we would have, symbolically speaking, still have separatism in the, in the US. Uh, doing stuff that are not totally within the law is part of uh, a transitional uh, phase. Uh, and therefore, I, I understand and support some way uh, of that, doing that. Here, thank you. As long as it's not violent, though. As long as it's not violent, yeah. Okay, because right now, to connect that also, these, the reason that these activists are acting so harshly and urgently is because there's a lot of things that were not being met. So in 2015, the world collectively signed the Paris Agreement, uh, committing to combat climate change by constraining global warming to a maximum of 1.5 degrees Celsius. This entails a 45% reduction in emissions by 2030 and a 90% reduction by... 2040 and ultimately uh, achieving net zero by 2050. Nonetheless, as of 2023, according to the World Resources Institute, our present trajectory indicates that we have an anticipated temperature increase of 2.4 to 2.6 degrees Celsius. While, while it's better than what we had in 2010, it still falls short of what we have set at the Paris Agreement. What should we do now in order to achieve this or to meet yeah. what we initially promised? No, it shouldn't surprise you, um, uh, as a global community and as uh, national states, we should regulate the biggest polluters. Mm -hmm. We can only achieve the scale of change necessary if we focus our attention on the biggest polluters. To give you an example, 25 companies in the world, they are the largest multinational companies in the world, uh, emit 50%, mm -hmm. five zero, of all greenhouse gases. Only to, it's less, if you would only have the CEO sitting here, it would be less people than is currently sitting in, the, in this hall. And still, they are not regulated. So what is necessary is to, to regulate them. And to give you an impression, we did some research uh, two years ago. We assessed the climate policies of the largest polluters in the Netherlands. And of the 29 companies that we assessed, their average reduction was 20% in 2030. Now, imagine if the biggest polluters in the world, the biggest polluters in the Netherlands, only reduce their CO2 by 20%. How can we as a society protect ourselves from dangerous climate change? Mm -hmm. But then, um, since you also mentioned the issue with multi regulating multinational corporations is that they're not in just one country, but in multiple countries. If we regulate here, do we see then a spillover? Will they go somewhere else? Or how can we then address that? Is the EU a potential alternative here? Yeah. Um, when we started our analysis on how can we address uh, uh, the biggest polluters, we saw that you have three options. Either you can depend on their voluntary action, negotiate with them, lobby them, that they, but of course uh, that they're not going to act because they profit from their emissions. The second is a global agreement. But uh, to give you an example of uh, the climate change agreement, it's now COP28, 
we've been negotiating for 28 years and we still don't have a binding agreement. So that is also not the way forward. And then our third option was to nationalize uh, the, the approach. So getting the Dutch court to apply within the Dutch uh, legal system international agreements to uh, a multinational company based in the Netherlands. And then, of course, the question is, uh, will they go away? Now, you know that uh, Shell went to London. I'm not going to say I chased Shell away. I think mm -hmm. there were more reasons. But uh, that is, of course, a, a, a possibility. But um, in, in essence, what we want to achieve is that other NGOs in other countries use our example and our success to apply it to other countries. So mm -hmm. then there's no way you can run as a multinational. Mm -hmm. And in addition, we think that the pressure created by uh, a climate litigation like in the Netherlands will be a stimulus for uh, the European Union to speed up their regulation, especially the CO2 border tax um, mm -hmm. measures. Yet this approach does take time. And you also mentioned that it's very difficult to democratically regulate pollution. For this reason, some young people, especially, for instance, in university, are saying that we ultimately need radical political and economical change in order to meet the Paris goals. Uh, how, do you, how would you respond to that? Uh, all, all measures within, uh, as long as they're non-violent, is acceptable for you. The urgency is so, uh, so uh, big that we need to, to uh, research all options to achieve change. Having said that, um, from a system change perspective, I cannot imagine a more radical approach than forcing companies to internalize uh, their pollution, mm -hmm. because that is the essence of the capitalist system. It's increasing your profit uh, by externalizing all costs onto society. Mm -hmm. If we manage, like we did with Shell, to force companies to internalize their costs, take responsibility and accountability for their own pollution, we, uh, we have really achieved system change. Okay, I guess first step in the right direction. Um, that said, we'd like to open the floor to some audience questions right now. Are there currently any in the house? No audience questions? Oh, there. I think a microphone will be brought to you. Yes. Uh, yeah, you're part of a group with scientists in them, and I was wondering if you think that scientists becoming politically active, active compromises the neutrality and perhaps their power to then speak to people who don't want to abide by climate goals? Um, that, is a, that is a very good question. Um, I believe that the power of scientists is there, uh, that, that they are independent, and science in itself is independent. Uh, on the other hand, once you've reached a conclusion as a scientist, um, it is understandable that you act on that conclusion, that you want to give visibility to uh, your conclusion. What I would say that scientists should not do is prescribe to society paths to change, because that is a political decision. So there they shouldn't take a role. But they can voice and make visible their conclusions that CO2 needs to be reduced, because that is an objective fact and not a political uh, uh, opinion. Um, and another question, the guy in the hat. Yes, hi, thank you very much, first of all. Um, you mentioned when I asked about the Rubble Bank action uh, that all sorts of protests that are non-violent uh, are legitimate, and um, which is something I really agree with, but also that depends a lot on your main definition of violence, right? So in that case, what would be your definition of violence to the point that it's not a legitimate protest anymore? Yeah, um, I think that, and that, that is also the, the background to your question, of course, there's, it's, it's a scale uh, from absolutely non-violent and something that comes into, uh, that can be interpreted as, uh, as violence. To start off with, uh, endangering the lives of uh, people is absolutely out of the question. So that is clearly that uh, non-violence means not hurting or endangering the lives or uh, uh, integrity uh, of people. Um, I would say also not damaging uh, stuff. But I know that that is a discussion. 
And why would I say not damaging property and, and stuff? Uh, because it, precisely of your question, once you, once you make the move to, um, to violence, in this case against uh, material items, uh, you, you open a, a door that you, uh, the, the box of Pandora, you open a, a space that you cannot control. So say if you, if you decide to, to uh, damage some property, what happens if, if somebody, without uh, you having um, purposefully wanting that, but gets in the way of, of what you've just done, and they get hurt? So it's better to, to be very principled in this and say, no violence. We will have more time for audience questions later. Uh, there will be a second block. But when we go to the Shell case, which you just men mentioned, uh, the Shell case is one of the biggest moments for Milieu Defensi as an organization. It was the landmark case against Shell, which you won in 2021. And to quote your lawyer, Roger Cox, he said, this is a turning point in history. This case is unique on a global scale because it is the first time a judge has ordered a large polluting corporation company to comply with the Paris Agreement. Um, but you're not a lawyer, so he wondered, because you're the director, what was your role in winning this court case? Um, uh, we made the decision to, uh, to start the court case, um, and we mobilized the funding necessary for the court case. Uh, and to be honest, when... Uh, when we had our first conversation with, uh, with Rosé Cox, he was still skeptical. Uh, and luckily so, because you need to be skeptical to develop your thoughts. Um, and even when we made the decision together with uh, Rosé Cox, uh, we then realized that even while we decided we want to prosecute Cell, uh, it would not be possible because it would be too expensive. So your question is, what did we contribute? I would say much more important is that it was impossible without the support of tens of thousands of Dutch people. We could not do it. So Milieu Defensi couldn't do it, and if we couldn't do it, Roger couldn't do it because somebody had to pay his, uh, his uh, cost. It was possible because tens of thousands of common Dutch people contributed to this campaign. Uh, the court papers in the end stated Milieu de Fancy versus Royal Dutch Shell. It should have said the people, the Dutch people versus Royal Dutch Shell. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that uh, despite that so many people contributed to this court case, that even your lawyer was skeptical at first, and the legal experts also were skeptical at first. Um, but what motivated you, and you gave it a bit away because you said attention, but what motivated you to try this court case regardless? And why Shell specifically? My basic motivation was we only have, at that stage, eight years left to, or it was 2021, so nine years left to address dangerous climate change. So that's five years, six years today? Yeah. yeah. Six years. Um, and so when we made the decision, it was 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've noticed, I've, I've been a, um, a lead negotiator lobbyist for WWF. I've participated in, the, in international climate conferences. I've experienced the absolute failure of uh, one of the largest international meetings on climate change that took place in 2009, uh, COP15. And I realized that um, business as usual is not working. We as an environmental movement have been lobbying, we've been campaigning, we've gone onto the streets, we've written letters, We've uh, convinced uh, politicians to take action, but still CO2 emissions were rising. So we needed to do something to totally out of the box, even though it was enormously risky. Because believe me, uh, now I'm sitting discussing with you this, uh, our success. If we failed, um, it would have had a lot of repercussions for the organization because we've, we spent millions to achieve this. And my members and my uh, board would have said, Donald, was that such a smart idea to spend all of this money on a, on a lost cause? So the, the reason was we need to, to find new ways to achieve um, an end to dangerous climate change. And were you surprised when you won since no company has ever been held accountable for, for example, the Paris Agreement? I think... 
um, uh, many people know, um, uh, do you know John Cleese, the Ministry of Silly Walks? <laughs> yeah. uh, if you see the photograph of me after the uh, outcome of the, 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 the court outcome was uh, announced, it seems like I've been, do I've been learning from the Ministry of Silly Walks. I was totally out of my mind. I was so extremely uh, happy. I didn't, on the one hand, you expect it because we've been working on it for five years. So you know we're right, and, and you've studied everything, and you're con but it's a rational thing. On an emotional level, you think, whoever is going to win a case against one of the biggest companies in the world? Mm -hmm. And I think we actually have the photo of one of the photos of you winning on the poster. So ah. Later on, you may have a look. Yeah, and then um, you see it's the Ministry of Silly Walks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that said, you, you mentioned that it's all, it was also, I guess, very difficult throughout the journey. What would you say was one of the most difficult points that you had to overcome? Um, I'm going to cite a, a CEO of one of the, la the largest polluter in the Netherlands, uh, Tata Steel, Hans van der Berg. And uh, two weeks after our court win, I had a discussion uh, with him, and I described sh shortly what, what we did. And he said, this is absolutely a wonder. And not because what I did, but what my staff did, because my staff are all more or less your, uh, the, the, the team that did the, the court case, are more or less your age. And he said, did they really work on this for five years? F a five-year project with people at, at your age without any assurance of the outcome? Nobody knew that we would win. Uh, in the beginning, there were two or three people. In the end, there were 30 people working in the smallest office in the in, in Milieu Fancy had no real support because everybody in the office thought that this was uh, totally uh, off the rocker. Uh, but they continued. Not I made it possible. My st th these young people that, that managed the, the campaign, they made it possible. And you mentioned that the CEO of Tata Steel called it a, a, a wonder, a, a yeah. miracle even. Was he, what was his response about this court case? Was he frustrated? Was he happy? What did he say to you about... Yeah, when, w what he then... Uh, he said, this changes everything. So that was his, his uh, he said everything, and, and within, I think, I'm not sure, I think three months after the court when he announced that they will stop uh, producing steel using coal, mm -hmm. partly because of uh, this case. You say this changes everything, and in uh, the higher appeal, this court case will take place in March or in April this year, to, no, 2024, so upcoming year. And for now, let's say that this verdict stands. What are the, some of the major consequences that we can expect? What, what, what's gonna, what, what is going to change? This is a, a very interesting question because two things can happen. Mm -hmm. The first is everything follows the regular procedures of a, um, of, of the, the, a, a democratic legal uh, state. And that is we win. Shell accepts the, their loss, announces that they will reduce their CO2. They can emit nine times as much CO2 as the whole of the Dutch economy together. So halving their uh, CO2 emissions in, is enormous. Um, other companies, afraid of being taken to court, follow suit, do the same thing, implement the Paris Climate Agreement in their policymakers in the European Union and other places uh, institutionalize the uh, legal outcome, that is the, the best outcome. The second option is that Shell says, and I wanted to make a, a lewd uh, uh, sign, you, we're not going to do it. We are not going to follow the outcome of a legal uh, uh, judgment in one of uh, uh, the e European uh, countries. We're going to continue what we were doing and see what you uh, can force us to do. Which is what is happening thus far. What's yeah. precisely what they're doing. And that will prove our basic point, because I started by saying it is not only about climate change. Mm -hmm. It is about one of the largest political economic institutions that we as a human society created that has really um, retracted itself mm -hmm. from democratic governance. They, in their boardrooms, in their shareholders' meetings, are deciding if they continue causing dangerous climate change or not. But we are not involved. 
They, decide, they are deciding our future as we speak, but we have no voice. And when they decide to not implement the outcome of the court judgment, they will prove our most fundamental basic point. And maybe to understand this court ruling better, and also maybe to understand why Shell has not complied so far, um, does the verdict account for Shell's business activities in the Netherlands or worldwide? It's worldwide. So from, a, from a, um, the innovative aspect of, of the, uh, the case is that uh, a multinational company yeah. with all of its uh, daughter's subsidiaries all over the world, including both its suppliers and its consumers, need to reduce their CO2. And so not only the Dutch company, not only their office, not only all of their business activities, not only in the Netherlands, but globally, but everybody involved in the system. And can Shell escape this verdict by moving completely away from the Netherlands, or is there any way to escape the Dutch yeah. legal system? Um, that's another uh, innovative approach. Um, we knew that this could be a problem, so we decided to follow commercial law. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really the, what, what the essence of the outcome of the court case is that the judge said you cannot cause damages. Just like when you cut the tree in your backyard and it falls over onto your neighbor's uh, yard um, and, and breaks his bicycle or his uh, townhouse or whatever, uh, that is a commercial question. Mm -hmm. And the CO2 emitted and is, is really the, the damage caused by Shell. And we have all over the world, especially the Western world, uh, commercial law is rather integrated. So uh, the outcome of a Dutch court can be applied really all over the world. And if they don't, we'll just confiscate their property. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like one approach. And if this verdict stands for Shell... It's a joke, just to be sure, because this is all legal. It's just a joke. It's just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and if this verdict stands for Shell, does this automatically mean it also stands for Tata Steel and other oil and gas companies or other polluting industries? Yes. Um, more so, uh, in the court judgment, the, court, the, the uh, judge said, in essence, all polluting companies have the responsibility to take account of the impacts of their business activities on society in general and human rights specifically. Okay, well, now that we, we know this vision, say that these companies do comply and, and do, by a miracle also, um, decrease, emit less by 45%. Do you think our current political and economic system is ready for this? The biggest changes in human history did not take place because society was ready for it, but because it was necessary. Um, white people in South Africa wasn't ready for the end of apartheid. Um, white males were not ready to give females the vote. Uh, industry bosses were not ready to give workers uh, children the right to go to school. It was demanded and forced onto them. Um, so what is ready should not be the question. It is, is it necessary? Oh, that sounds like quite a quote. But, but, what I'm thinking is, if we're not ready, because climate change and climate action needs to be taken democratically. And if we're not ready, we, which for example, we've seen an influx of prices of oil and gas, because we don't have all the energy substitutes available. Um, so the economic costs could go up, for instance. So, so don't you think that it's important that if we demand Shell to reduce 45%, if we demand other competi competitional Shell to do this 45%, we need, to we need to have options available because we need oil and gas for basic, basic needs. We need energy. We don't need oil and gas. And there's enough alternatives uh, available to replace oil and gas. And imagine, the question is, should the business of model of Shell, should that continue? Or should we as a human society globally, a civilization, should that continue? Ooh, that's a very difficult uh, uh, decision to make. Of course, when the question is, can we continue human civilization in the way that we know it? Mm -hmm. Or should the business model of Shell continue? Of course, the, question, the, the answer would always be our right as human society to continue, which should be... Uh, the preference. Shell is not forcing people to buy their products, their oil and gas from them. People consume them voluntarily. Um, the, 
The question is what you're, what you're uh, aiming at is the question of responsibility. Um, and so, and what is the responsibility of an individual and what is the responsibility of Shell? And responsibility is the consequence of at least three criteria. It is the, uh, your contribution to a problem. It is your, the means that you have to change the problem and the knowledge that you have of the necessity to take change. And these three criteria, if you see that, the comparison, if you compare Shell with a, a common consumer, then Shell's responsibility is much larger. We have a responsibility, but Shell also has a responsibility, and their responsibility is, is much bigger than the individual's responsibility. Now, taking this and moving to a, another field that you've also been very invested in, uh, Milieu de Vinci at least, on fossil subsidies. Last month, Milieu de Vinci published a report which found that the Dutch government spends 40 billion on fossil subsidies on a yearly basis, while previous reports estimated that to be 17.5 billion, and now newer reports are estimating even more uh, higher amounts of subsidies. Did the report's findings surprise you? Yes, also because the government, Dutch government also did some research, uh, and their outcome, their conclusion was that the Dutch subsidies of uh, only 4 billion. Now, 4 billion is also too much, um, and, and they confirmed our outcome a bit later. But it's really ludicrous that on an issue this important that an NGO has to tell the government that their facts and figures are not correct. Uh, because government should be representing our common interest. But clearly, they are, re they are representing the interest of the receivers of that 40 billion uh, subsidies. Um, and that is why they don't want to change. Because we've gotten into a, a situation in which um, Government changed its role as, as, in some way, instead of representing the common public good, mm -hmm. they represent special interests, the interest of the receivers of the 40 billion uh, fossil fuel subsidies. And that needs to change. And that, in that, in, from that perspective, really, addressing climate change is an issue of addressing democracy. We need real democracy again, in which government is the representative of the people. And just to clarify, I guess, for those who aren't that familiar, why do you think it's so also important for us to bring down the number of fossil subsidies to zero? They say in a, if you're in a hole and you want to get out, the first thing you should do is stop digging. And financing fossil fuel emissions is a way of digging us deeper into this problem. So before we even have a discussion if there are enough alternatives for, for fossil fuel, we should stop financing uh, fossil fuels. And really what, what fossil fuels does uh, is it puts an, a lid, uh, um, a break on the development of alternatives to fossil fuels. Because as long as we subsidize fossil fuels to the amount of 40 billion per year only in the Netherlands, it is almost impossible for green alternatives like sun energy and uh, wind energy and geothermal, etc., uh, energy saving, it's almost, almost impossible for them to compete. Which, which nascent sector, upcoming sector, can compete with an industry that receives 40 billion uh, subsidies from government? It's almost, it is really, from that perspective, it is uh, absolutely amazing what is the success of renewable uh, energy. Imagine on your question on uh, that there are no alternatives, imagine if there was no 40 billion subsidies, or that that 40 million subsidies went into the development of uh, renewables and alternatives. We would have addressed climate change long ago. So yesterday, the Dutch parliament voted in favor of a motion on fossil subsidies. As of this, before Christmas, three different scenarios to phase out fossil subsidies between two or seven years will be proposed to Parliament. Does this mean that your mission is completed now? If they do it, um, but, and, and I'm, I, I, I want to compliment Extinction Rebellion, that's really at the basis of, uh, of this motion. Mm -hmm. But having uh, worked in politics for, for some decades, uh, I, 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 I've become a bit cynical. Um, but politicians accept a lot of motions. It is about the implementation of the... To give you an example, in 2009, the Dutch government, for the first time, agreed 
to uh, develop a plan that will re uh, phase out fossil fuels. That's 2009. And they signed an international agreement to do this. So you if you, and still, in 2023, uh, they haven't done it. So um, my answer to that is, I believe it. I'm very happy. I'm very enthusiastic. But let's keep on the pressure. Speaking about that, the Dutch PVD Minister of Economic Affairs, Mickey Adriaansens, gave an interview last week. And she's also the one who's responsible for these subsidies. And she said it would be a stupid policy to abandon all fossil subsidies now. Adriaansens, the minister, is afraid that doing this would force these companies out of the Netherlands towards countries whose climate policies are less strict. Let's say the minister is in the audience and she just said it, your plan is a stupid idea. How would you respond to her? I would say a company that in the, in the Netherlands that cannot compete against other companies in a climate restrained, in a CO2 restrained world without subsidies has no future. It is, it is absolutely ludicrous that we say we're going to keep alive companies that cannot compete without subsidies because that will mean that we will have to subsidize them forever. If, we, if, if they need the subsidies now, they'll need them forever. So that's the one. The second is um, the Netherlands should, instead of being a, a paradise for fossil fuel companies, for polluting companies, it should become a paradise for clean companies. Instead of using the 40 billion for fossil fuel subsidies, let's accept that we're going to keep 40 billion subsidies for companies, as an argue, for argument's sake. But then, let us th then reserve those subsidies for companies that have a, a, a climate plan uh, in accordance with international climate agreements. So you're saying to let them leave, and instead we're going to attract greener, innova innova innovative companies? Both. So we'll lose companies that cannot compete internationally without subsidies, okay. and we'll use, because there's nothing like a, a subsidy. It's taxpayers' money. It's your money. Should we use all of our money that can be used in a better way to subsidize companies that have had three decades of time to change their practices? They knew about climate change. Exxon and Shell knew about climate change early in the 1970s, and still they do not change. And still they demand. They're not asking. They're not saying, thank you for subsidizing, subsidizing us for f 50 decades or five decades. They're not saying, thank you, Dutch society. We appreciate that you subsidized us. We think that we have the responsibility to do something. No, they're demanding. They're saying, you have to subsidize us. If you do not subsidize us, we will leave. That's chantage. It is not a request. Right. Um, and with that, you, we also have the goal to change, to bring the fossil subsidies down to zero. And in order to do this, you mentioned a lot about milieu defense lobbying and proposing this. So do you work with different political parties within, say, the Netherlands to achieve this goal? Or? Yeah, our theory of change is very much aimed at mobilizing uh, the general public. So we do lobbying. We have a very, I think we have uh, 20 uh, lobbyists. But the main focus of our work is to create public pressure that can then be translated into, into uh, lobbying. So our main focus is informing people, uh, providing tools for the general public to uh, achieve policy change both in government and, uh, and uh, companies. Uh, and therefore we work very closely together with other civil society organizations like the labor union, like the, um, uh, the organization representing tenants, uh, uh, like... Political uh, parties? Also political parties, yeah. Because um, when I took a look at the election manifestos and the ideas you propose on the Milieu Defensi website, because you're saying, instead of the 40 billion of fossil subsidies, we have ideas to make it an inclusive and green transition. What are some of these policy ideas that you have in mind? Yeah. We um, campaign for what we call equitable climate policy, and that is policy in which the general public, uh, households, especially households with uh, middle income and lower income households, and uh, small uh, businesses are the main uh, beneficiaries of climate policy. Uh, currently, policy is op the, the opposite. 80% of all uh, 
subsidies, climate subsidies that go to households, go to the 20% richest people. Uh, and of course, the large majority of subsidies in general go to large multi multinationals. So we say, turn it around. And um, uh, if you allow me, I'll, it, the, what we call new liberal climate policy is based on the trickle-down theory. So mm -hmm. the idea of current new liberal climate policy is if we get people at the top of society, richer people, people that, that are well off, if we can get them to uh, adopt climate technology, like electric vehicles and the solar PV and insulating houses, uh, if we can get them to adapt, it will trickle down to the rest of society. It's this trickle-down theory is proven to not work. But this is the dominant perspective. That is the dominant perspective of government uh, and big business. And we say we uh, say we follow the sponge theory mm -hmm. of economy. The economy is like a sponge. If you put put it into water, it sucks up water. Money flows from the bottom to the top. That's uh, so. If we want society to adopt clean energy and sustainable uh, practices, we have to ensure that the people at the bottom get access to uh, uh, to those technologies because that will be like a sponge, it will be sucked up to, uh, to the rest of society. To give you an example, if we invest um, in insulating the homes and, uh, and providing green electricity of the poorest million houses in the Netherlands, that will ensure not only that these people get access to uh, low-cost energy, uh, use less energy, but it will become so, because of scaling, it will become so inexpensive to uh, adopt these measures that rich people can pay it for themselves. You don't need subsidies anymore. And are the political parties that have adopted the sponge theory in their um, manifesto? More and more so, yeah. Um, we did uh, an analysis and uh, um, almost the whole of the political uh, uh, middle mm -hmm. uh, so not the extreme uh, right, has adopted this, this approach. But of course, the next step is then, so they've adopted the theory uh, that we have been campaigning on. The next is, are they going to implement it? Mm -hmm. So we, we have designed, a, we will announce it early next year, uh, a, a model, an economic model, in which we can calculate uh, if um, government is implementing what we call just an equitable climate policy. Well, what we have coming up is actually the Dutch elections. Do, we, do you have any plans for that? Any? Actually, we decided to limit our uh, campaigns for the um, elections, partly because just of uh, uh, challenges in, uh, internally. So you need to prioritize. Okay. Um, but do climate change is gaining more and more traction and climate action is increasingly recognized as more pressing and important by the day. But meanwhile, there also seems to be some form of pushback in the general public in developed Western countries, such as the Netherlands, against the transi transition to a green society. Some citizens believe or fear that the transition to a green economy is too costly for them. Do you think there's validity in this concern? I understand the, the, the concern fully, and um, it relates to what we just discussed, mm -hmm. new liberal climate policy versus just an equitable uh, climate policy. And I want to share with you a, a, a thought experiment. Say that you represented uh, a fossil fuel, fossil fuel interest, and you see that the whole of society is supporting climate policy that will hurt your business. And you know you cannot resist that any, anymore because uh, uh, it's become a societal consensus and, and, and science supported. You cannot resist climate policy anymore. What would then be your strategy? If I was representing fossil fuel interest, I would lobby for a climate policy that shifts the largest cost onto poor people. Because you know poor people will resist that, and rightly so. Now, interestingly enough, our current climate policy is precisely working like that. Like I said, 80% of all subsidies go to the 20% richest people, while poor people pay three to four times as much uh, energy tax compared to rich people. But yet, if we look at the uh, polls of today, because currently there's no democratic majority for a green decision 
range transition as envisioned by Milieu Defensie. For instance, the political parties that fully support the phasing out of fossil subsidies currently poll only 51 seats if the election were today. So how do you think this concern or this, what you're saying, this message, should be, could it be better addressed? Because currently, uh, more people in the, Dutch in the Dutch public are planning on voting for a party that says, no, we're going to keep the subsidies. Or you are saying, hey, this poses an, an in unfair cost on the poor. It should be said, and that's why I said addressing climate change is a democratic uh, uh, challenge, uh, not a technical uh, or financial challenge. 70% of the general public supports the the demand that fossil fuel subsidies should be fa phased out. Uh, and therefore, our challenge as an NGO is to mobilize this general consensus in, uh, or the large majority in uh, society to put pressure on the political parties that are still resisting the phase out of fossil fuel subsidies. And it has to be said, uh, a majority of the Dutch parliament yesterday voted in favor of the motion to uh, uh, phase out fossil fuels. To explore scenarios. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. True. I mean, true. That's why, um, generally, people, we, we would love to have a, a, a beautiful end state, but society is uh, all will is and will always be a competition of ideas and forces. So that we shouldn't strive towards an an, an idealized, sustainable, climate-friendly uh, end state. It will only happen, we will only achieve uh, a climate-friendly society if we all, together with Milieu Defensie and other organizations, keep on pressuring uh, uh, politics and big companies to take action. I think this is a nice moment for a final round of audience questions. Yes. Um, the gentleman, front. If uh, we are aware that in Paris, the two sectors of the economy were kept out, the international shipping and the militarism, then that's a problem. Um, if the preparing for war and waging war would be one country, it would be the fourth largest country of uh, uh, producing CO2. What is uh, uh, Friends of the Earth doing to tackle this issue? Um, I'm, I'm very impressed about what we uh, can achieve as a Milieu Defensie, and we have achieved a lot, uh, and our colleague organizations across the world even more so. Um, but ending global war uh, is maybe a bit too ambitious. Uh, I think as, as citizens, I'm just as shocked as what's happening in Israel and Palestine and uh, Ukraine and Russia at this stage. Uh, I feel small when I see that, and I feel anger and, and uh, uh, empathy for, for people. Um, but I have no... I, I cannot stop that, and we cannot stop that. What we can do is to increase democracy uh, in order for politicians to, to not start wars. What we can do is uh, increase the regulation for companies that we're doing in order for companies not having the space to stimulate the start, uh, starting of wars, because you know that wars are not only started by politicians, they're also started by, they, you know what they say, at the end of the war there's an, always one winner, and those are the banks. Um, uh, what we can do is to regulate companies that they do not profit from war and climate change. So it's gentleman with the blue turtleneck. Uh, thank you so much, um, also for the talk. I was just wanting to zoom back on the Shell case. I know that in the UK there is a similar case pending where the board of directors should be personally held liable. Is this something that you considered as well in the Netherlands and how do you rate the success chances of uh, cases like that? Now, I do not want to comment on the specific case in the, in the UK because I haven't studied it and I don't know the, the legal system in the UK that well. Um, but it's clear that the that, uh, next frontier in climate litigation will be after having won the case that we've done and similar cases across the world where you hold companies liable uh, and accountable. 
uh, that the future, if companies do not act in accordance to the outcome of a, of a legal uh, court order, uh, that the members of the board will have a responsibility. That is clear. Um, I think those are all the questions for now, but after uh, the interview itself, you may also approach us uh, to ask your questions. Um, that said, what can we look forward from Milieu Defensi? You mentioned that elections is not a priority, so what is? Yes, we, are, um, we will shortly uh, announce our next uh, climate litigation uh, case, and um, uh, it will be uh, as impactful as the case against Shell. Okay, well, we're excited for the next big fish that you're trying to catch. Um, and aside from that, what do you think is the next step beyond that for Milieu Defensi in a attaining the target goals of climate? Our theory of change is based on uh, creating and visualizing, making visible public support for uh, ambitious and equitable climate policy. So in the, uh, and, and, and I believe personally that one of the reasons that, that we haven't had uh, ambitious enough climate policy is that we haven't had large-scale public mobilizations. And we will, together with our uh, 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 colleague civil society organizations, um, invest m a, a major effort into mobilizing the general public in the coming years. Okay. Because all, all change, and that is really... We should, uh, that was also a question, this, the, this, the, 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 the powers that be want us to believe that we are ineffectual as individuals, that we have no impact, because if they can convince us that we have no impact, we will not act as if we have impact. And we can only have impact if we take each other's hands, if we get together. If we're alone, we have no impact. But if we get together, if we mobilize together, we can achieve the biggest results that history has known. And that has happened in the, in the past also. And hopefully it will continue happening. And it will continue happening. Education, awareness, and also university, um, where we can share this uh, and have these platforms for communication. That said, thank you so much for joining us today. This is the end of our interview. Um, and for that, let's first give a big round of applause for Donald Coles. Thank you, and thank you. Um, aside for that, for the audience here today, if you'd like to stay tuned with our upcoming interviews, feel free to check our website. We also have a community where you can subscribe and get newsletters of all the people coming up. That said, thank you so much for joining the discussion today. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, feel free to join us after. Well, thank you. Thank you.